Listen to the conversation between the woman and the man and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Hello, Paragliders Paradise. How can I help you? Oh, hi. I'm interested in doing a course in paragliding. Which course are you interested in? Well, I'm not sure. What's available? Well, we've got the introductory course which lasts for two days. OK. Or there's the four-day beginners course, which is what most people do first. I'd tend to recommend that one. And there's also the elementary pilot course, which takes five to six days depending on conditions. We might try the beginners course. What sort of prices are we looking at? The introductory is $190. The beginner's course, which is probably what you'd be looking at, is $320. No, sorry, $330. It's just gone up. And the pilot course is $430. Right. And you also have to become a member of our club so that you're insured. That'll cost you $12 a day. Everyone has to take out insurance, you see. Does that cover me if I break a leg? No, I'm afraid not. It's only third party and covers you against damage to other people or their belongings, but not theft or injury. You would need to take out your own personal accident insurance. I see. And what's the best way to get to your place? By public transport or could we come by bike? We're pretty keen cyclists. It's difficult by public transport, though there is a bus from Newcastle. Most people get here by car, though, because we're a little off the beaten track. But you could ride here, OK? I'll send you a map. Just let me take down a few details. What's your name? Maria Gentle. And your address, Maria? Well, I'm a student staying with a family in Newcastle. So it's care of... Care of Mr and Mrs MacDonald. Like the hamburgers? <laughs> yes, exactly. MacDonald. The post office box address is probably best. It's P.O. Box 676, Newcastle. Is there a fax number there? Because I could fax you the information. Yes, actually there is. It's 0249, that's for Newcastle, and then 775431. OK, now if you decide to do one of our courses, you'll need to book in advance and to pay when you book. How would you be paying? Uh, by credit card, if that's OK. Do you take Visa? Yes, fine. We take all major cards, including Visa. OK, then. Thanks very much. The girl is telling her friend about the course. Look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen to their conversation and answer questions 8 to 10. Hi, Pauline. Hi, Maria. What's that you're reading? Just some information from a paragliding school. It looks really good fun. Do you fancy a go at paragliding? Sure. Do you have to buy lots of equipment and stuff? Not really. The school provides the equipment, but we'd have to take a few things along. Such as? Well, it says here, clothes, uh, Wear stout boots, so no sneakers or sandals, I suppose. And clothes suitable for an active day in the hills. Preferably a long sleeve t-shirt. That's probably in case you land in the stinging nettles. It also says we should bring a packed lunch. 
we do not recommend soft drinks or flasks of coffee. <laughs> Water is really the best thing to drink. Uh, we need to bring suntan lotion and something to protect your head from the sun. Okay, that sounds reasonable. And where would we stay? Well, look, they seem to operate a campsite too, because it says here that it's only $10 a day to pitch a tent. That'd be fine, wouldn't it? And that way would save quite a bit, because even a cheap hotel would cost money. Uh, or perhaps we could stay in a bed and breakfast nearby. It gives a couple of names here we could ring. I think I might prefer that. <laughs> uh, hotels and youth hostels would all be miles away from the farm, and I don't fancy a caravan. No, I agree. But let's take a tent and pray for good weather. OK, let's do it. <laughs> what about next weekend? No, I can't. I'm going on a geography field trip. And then it's the weekend before the exams and I really do need to study. OK then, let's make it the one after the exams. Fine. We'll need a break by then. Can you ring and let me know if you can find out some... That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear Dr. Joanna Robinson, the course director of a language learning centre, answering questions from reporters from the student newspaper. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Welcome to the Language Learning Center. I'm Joanne Robinson. You must be the reporters from the Examiner. Please come in and sit down. Hello, Dr. Robinson. Yes, we're from the Examiner. I'm Cheryl Perkins, and this is Don Klim. May I start with a question? Did this college really start with Brazilian students? It did. The Language Learning Center was founded in 1985 to look after a group of students from Brazil who wanted to study here. Those 20 students soon grew to 60, and as you can imagine, we had severe accommodation problems. Somebody said you were in the old amenities block, right near the engineering school. They have a good memory. Yes, we were there because the university hadn't believed we would expand so quickly. The problem wasn't solved until we moved into these new premises in Bancroft House in 1987. When did you start taking students from other countries? About 1990. We now have students from 13 different countries enrolled, and we expect a large group from Turkey next month. Yes, we've noticed a lot more advertisements for Turkish restaurants in our advertising section. Well, 40% of our students come from Turkey, by far the largest single national group and I believe there's been an influx to the rest of the university. There are a lot of Turkish students studying hospitality. Do you offer anything special to the students? Yes, we do. There are several things which make us rather different from other language schools. English is certainly not restricted to English for academic purposes here. Sometimes we have extra classes for students who have particular courses in mind. And we have just said goodbye to a group of 30 Indonesian students who were preparing for a university course in agriculture. They came to us for English for Farming, and they were with us for a long time. We miss them. How long do students usually stay at the Language Learning Centre? It varies, so I'll talk about the average. Most of our courses last for five weeks. 
But to make any real progress, a student needs to be here for at least three terms. That's 15 weeks. The students do better if they have a little time to settle in at the beginning of the course, and we offer an orientation course that lasts a week. Most students take it. It helps them to settle down, and it gives us plenty of time to test them and place them at the right level. How many people are in each class? We sometimes go up to 18. But our average class size is 14 students, and some classes have as few as seven participants. It depends on the needs of the group. You were saying that you miss your students when they go. How do you attract students? I mean, how do they hear about the Language Learning Centre in the first place? We're included in the university advertising and marketing, and we have our own website. The thing which works best for us, though, is word of mouth. Students who leave us often send us their friends. In fact, a student who arrived today was carrying a photograph for me of a former student and his baby. It sounds like a nice place to be. It is. A lot of our students make lasting friendships while they're here. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Making friends with other students sounds special enough. I'd like to emphasize that in the student newspaper. We do try to get our students to be part of the wider university. How do you do that? Do you encourage them to join the sports center, for instance? Indeed, we do. The sports center is always looking for active participants, particularly in soccer. Oh, and something else. You might like to mention that we don't teach just English here. I mean, we're a language center, not an English language center. You may learn Spanish, Mandarin, and Russian here, and we can sometimes offer other languages. This means we can have some students who are native speakers of those languages as conversation partners for English-speaking students. Who can do these courses? At this stage, any native speaker of English. What about the people who are learning English? Can they do a non-English language course? At this time, only if they've almost finished their English language course. You see, we try very hard to involve students who are native speakers of English as conversation leaders, and we encourage our students to join groups on the campus. For instance, if they enjoy music, there is an active jazz group available to everyone, and that's a lot of fun. On the other hand. Elementary students can't go to the drama group. Their English just isn't ready for that sort of activity. But the university choir welcomes all the singers it can find. They often do large productions that need a lot of voices. I imagine the special conversation groups are open to all your students. I wish they were. I'm sorry to say they're a special service we provide for elementary students only. Is there anything else I can tell you? I'd be really pleased if you could write about the courses we offer in foreign languages. I think our readers will be very interested in that. Thank you for your time, Dr. Robinson. Yes, thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about the center. It's always good to let the rest of the students at the university know what goes on in our classrooms and outside them. After all, many of our students leave us and then study for degrees in various disciplines on this campus. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. And welcome to this morning's lecture on transport. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Good morning and welcome to this morning's lecture on transport. What I'll be doing today is comparing forms of transport in different countries to see how forms of transport are affected by factors such as geographical landscape and economic development. My focus will be on countries in South America, Europe and Asia. The first country I'd like to look at is Colombia, which is in South America. This is a country where geography plays an important role. Due to the huge amount of mountains and forests in this country, travelling by air is crucial. I don't know if many of you realise this fact, but Colombia was the first country to establish a commercial airline, and in so doing they made aviation history. Today, there are more than 400 airports in Colombia for domestic flights, which highlights the point I made earlier, that air travel is a vital means of transport in this country. Colombia also has a road network of about 48,000 kilometres, linking Colombia to Venezuela and Ecuador. Transport by road is important for trade as well as tourism. Apart from this, there is also a railway system, but it is in need of modernisation. The other means of transport is by steamers, with the Magdalena being the main waterway. Now let's turn to Colombia's neighbour, Venezuela. Once again, we see that internal flights are an important means of transport, as like Colombia, Venezuela has remote areas where flying is the easiest means of travelling from A to B. Trains are not popular, and most of the railway lines are in the highlands, as this is where the iron ore mines are. Trains are an efficient means of transporting the iron ore from the mines to the factories. Thus we can see how transport and the economy are interrelated. Ships are also used extensively in this country, and there are many ports, the main seaports being Puerto Cabello and Guanta. Turning now to Europe. Belgium is a country that boasts one of the most compact railway systems worldwide. Inland waterways, or canals, are also an important means of transport, transporting both freight and people. Belgium also has the third largest seaport in the world, namely Antwerpen. Air travel is also important, although this is not linked to geographical terrain, as is the case in the South American countries we've already looked at. Next, I'd like to look at the United Kingdom. Like Belgium... The UK has inland waterways around 4,000 kilometres, yet only about 17% of these are used for commercial transport. The main inland port is Manchester, and the chief seaport is London, with Southampton taking second place. Air travel is extensive in this country, and there are around 150 airports, the most famous being Heathrow. However, about 90% of passengers in the UK travel by road. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Finally, I'd like to look at two Asian countries. China is a country which reveals how geographical size affects transport development. Roads and railways are widely used, and this has led to a huge amount of bridges being built, such as the Yangtze Bridge, which is probably the most widely known. The Yangtze Bridge is 1.6 kilometres long and is built on two levels. The upper tier is for cars and pedestrians, while the lower is for trains. Railways are especially important, and over 80% of freight and passengers are transported by rail. With such a high proportion of people using trains, it is not surprising that governments in countries like China are prepared to invest in the railway system. Obviously, a fast and effective train service will encourage businesses and the general public to continue using it. 
The last country I'm going to mention is Japan, which has one of the most advanced transport systems in the world. The railway system is highly developed, and the Takedo Railway, connecting Tokyo and Osaka, has trains that can travel up to 250 kilometres per hour. Ships are also a vital means of transport in both international and domestic areas. To summarise, we can see that transport varies throughout the world. Yet the importance of transport networks, be they air, sea, rail, or road, cannot be underestimated. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear someone talking about art. Look at questions thirty-one to thirty-five. Listen to the first part and answer questions thirty-one to thirty-five. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the first in this year's series of public lectures offered by the Art Gallery. As chief curator of the gallery, I was given the honour of presenting the first lecture, and let me tell you, I had a difficult time deciding what to talk about tonight. Being the curator, I naturally know just about everything that's in this gallery, but I wanted to choose an artist who has a wide appeal. That seems only fair, yes. But I didn't want to talk about someone so well known that anything I said would be familiar. I wanted someone modern. My personal preference is for modern art. But again, I wanted to choose someone who had the potential to appeal to all art lovers, whether they're attracted to traditional forms, impressionism, surrealism, or what have you. So, having spent the last five years as a visiting professor in Barcelona, it's not surprising that I finally chose to talk about one of the greatest Catalan artists, one whose work is likely to be familiar to many of you. Juan Miro. Look at this, and this, and this. Ring any bells? Miro's most famous and most widely reproduced works tend to be like this: bright primary colors with lots of asymmetrical forms. He painted on large canvases. Larger than himself, quite often, and his paintings depicted birds, trees, flowers, and other features of the natural world. But Miro produced a great variety of work, and it's about some of his lesser-known paintings that I would like to speak this evening. Miro was born in Barcelona in 1893, the son of a goldsmith. He began to show talent very early. And in 1926, went to Paris, where he was drawn to the surrealists of Montparnasse. He did not define himself as a surrealist, however. He preferred to stay free to experiment with other artistic styles as he wished. Miro had an intense dislike of much of the painting and many of the painters he knew. He wished to do something totally different, to express his contempt for bourgeois art. And yet, ironically, Miro's success has made his works much in demand among art collectors of the world. But we can't really talk about the artist without looking at his art, and that's what I'd like to do now: 
to take a look at just a few of Miro's works and think about what it is that makes them special. Special to me and to a great number of people who flock every day to the Miro Foundation in Barcelona. Now look at questions 36 to 40. As the lecture continues, answer questions 36 to 40. Let's start with this. One of Miro's best known and brightest works, Woman and Bird. A sculpture created in 1982. It is on display in a park in Barcelona, often known as the Juan Miro Park. A huge sculpture towering up into the sky. It reflects Miro's eternal interest in these themes, as well as his more technical interest in materials. This sculpture is covered in mosaic, which gives it a naive and cheerful appearance. It is interesting that this sculpture was completed in 1982, just a year before Miro's death. I think it shows that, towards the end, he was feeling as playful as a young man. And I think he wanted to share this playfulness in a park on such a big, very public scale. And now, another representation of a woman, this time just called Woman. This was painted in 1976, a late work for Miro, and is a work we often see reproduced or on sale as postcards or posters in gallery shops around the world. So why is it so popular? I think the use of colour has something to do with it. People respond to these rounded shapes filled with primary colours, especially on a large canvas like this. Also, the fact that, while it is rather surreal, it is still possible to recognise the form of a woman and to see it as a sympathetic representation. It's a bold, bright painting. And I think that it awakens a reaction in many of us. And finally, something quite different, though still a woman. A harsh, even violent work that was completed in 1939, at a time when Miro was greatly influenced by events of the Civil War in Spain. It's titled Seated Woman Too, but it can be hard to find the woman here as she's been transformed into a rather horrendous creature. So is that how Miro viewed women? As grotesque? Not at all. This picture can also be seen as strong, with a huge base and solid shoulders to support those who depend on her. In this painting, her arms and neck seem to grow as vegetation out of her shoulders, representing woman as a fertile ground, perhaps. We also see here the fish and birds, the moon and stars so typical of Miro's work, making her a creature of nature and of the heavens as well. And that's all we have time for this evening, I'm afraid. I hope that you've enjoyed this brief look at Miro's work and that you will enjoy the other lectures that follow this one. Thank you and good night. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.